Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord, and Savior, our great Rescuer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I mentioned briefly in the children's message, for several years on Sunday afternoons in the summer, I was standing on a dock next to a group of young people, sometimes Boy Scouts, sometimes Venturers, and they were about to take their swim test. Now, Boy Scouts, in order to use the rowboats and to take canoes out and to swim in the fun section of the swimming area, you have to demonstrate that you can actually swim. So you have to pass a test. You have to do three laps with a forward stroke, one lap of a backstroke, and then you have to float on your back. Does that sound familiar to any of you out there? Well... In order to protect the people taking the test, I had to do some training myself. I had to learn how to roll up the rope with the life preserver and throw the life preserver so that it wouldn't get knotted up and caught because it would be a bad thing if the life preserver ends up hitting you in the face instead of going over your shoulder like it's supposed to. So you had to practice a lot of throwing for that and you had to learn how to use the shepherd's hook. You had to know how to take your stance so that the person who's in distress wouldn't be able to pull you into the water as well, and knowing when to use each one of those things. Now, fortunately, I did not have to use them very often, but most of the time that I did was during the swim test. There were many kids who weren't quite sure whether or not they could swim that full distance, and some of them had never been in a lake, so since they couldn't see the bottom, they were a little concerned And I had a couple even jump in, and they just sunk right to the bottom, and the only way they could get back up was by pushing off of the bottom, and then I had to rescue them. But the truth is that sometimes we all need rescuing. Maybe not from swimming in a swimming area at a summer camp or at your local pool, but at some point in our lives, often many, many times, we need rescuing. Well, this water theme continued with our Bible stories. We had vacation Bible, store, vacation Bible school this week, and many of the stories had a theme of water because the overall theme was making waves. Now, we weren't literally talking about making waves in water. We were talking about making waves in the world. And we learned that because Jesus has rescued us and that He now works through us with His Holy Spirit to affect the world in mighty ways. That's how we make waves. We make them when we keep our eyes on Jesus and have faith in Him. And one of the stories we learned about was our gospel reading today from Matthew 14, a story that you have probably heard many times. It's one of the most famous stories in the Bible, Jesus walking on water. But this story really beautifully illustrates the relationship between God and His people, His disciples and us, when it comes to this idea of making waves. How exactly does it work? And it turns out that the only way to do it is by keeping our eyes on Jesus. So, to set up the story, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, and He sends, the beginning of our gospel reading says that He sends the disciples ahead of him in the boat while he dismisses the crowd, which is sort of odd. The Sea of Galilee is not a massive ocean, but it's still pretty big, so was he planning on walking around the lake to meet them on the other side? But he needed some of his own space to pray. Jesus does this often. And so he dismisses the crowds, and he goes up on a mountain by himself to pray. And so as he's doing that, evening came, And the disciples, their boat is drifting out to sea. And it says specifically that the waves are beating against the boat. The waves are against them. It's the middle of the night. It says the fourth watch of the night, which would have been about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., that Jesus then walks out to the disciples. And He walks out to them on the water. Now, here is where we begin to see the nature of our relationship with Jesus and how it affects this idea of making 
waves. So the first part of what we're going to evaluate in the text here is what the disciples do without Jesus. There's a couple of parts in here where they decide to do things on their own without Jesus, and we're going to see how that turns out for them. So the first one is that Jesus is walking out to them on the water, and what is their reaction? Notice that it doesn't say like before with Jesus calming the storm that they're afraid of the wind and the waves. I mean, these are capable fishermen after all. They're used to being in a boat. They're just fine until they see Jesus walking on the water. Do they recognize him? No, they don't. They're terrified, the text says, not just merely afraid, but terrified. And they make a false confession about who Jesus is. They say, it is a ghost. Now, before we start laughing at that, sort of seems reasonable. I don't know about you, but I've never seen somebody walking towards me on the water at three in the morning. That might be a reasonable response. But the point is that on their own, they don't even recognize Jesus and they cry out in fear. They're terrified. Now, what does Jesus do in response? He could have said, how do you guys not recognize me? We've been literally spending every day together for the past couple of years going around and doing the works of ministry. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't chastise or rebuke them. It says that he immediately speaks to them in their fear and says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, we usually translate as do not be afraid. The Greek has more of the sense of stop being afraid. I'm here. So Jesus identifies himself. All right, the next part where the disciples do something without Jesus. Right after this, all this goes down, and then Peter's like, still not quite sure. That's not good enough for me. I need a little bit more proof. So he says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. On his own, Peter needs a little more proof. And probably more than we care to admit, the words of Jesus are often not enough for us either. We want more proof, more than we deserve to request. What does Jesus do? Does he say, I don't need to do that? Or you should now be able to recognize me. I've identified myself to you. You have no right to request this of me. And if you think about it, I mean, we sort of read over that sentence, but Peter's request is strange. He's asking for supernatural proof that Jesus is really who he says he is. He's like, if it's really you, then I'll, I should be able to walk on the water towards you, which is a strange request. And yet Jesus indulges Peter's outrageous demand. He mercifully grants it, even a request like, if it's really you, command me to walk to you on the water. And Jesus responds simply by saying, come. Come. And you would think now, surely at this point, there's no more elements of our interaction with Jesus. Surely at this point, Peter and the disciples, they get it. Jesus is here. There's nothing to be afraid of. He's demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that he really is who he says he is. But if you think that, you would be disappointed. Because Peter does get out of the boat and walk on the water. And he makes it as we understand from the text, all the way to Jesus. He's standing next to Jesus. But then he notices the wind, and he becomes afraid. He becomes afraid, he stops looking at Jesus, and then he begins to sink. How often do we lose sight of Jesus even after He's identified himself to us. He's done a great act of mercy on our behalf. And still, our eyes get pulled towards the wind and the worries of the world and the fears that we have, and we begin to sink. The truth is we take for granted the things that Jesus does regularly for us in our life. His great acts of mercy in our life. 
are easily forgotten when the wind picks up and the fear takes over. We stop looking at Jesus. We stop trusting in His ability to take care of us, to deal with this particular thing that we're focused on, despite the fact that He's already demonstrated His ability to deal with those things. Because you'll recall there's another story that involves Jesus in a boat with His disciples. This story has already occurred. So the disciples know that Jesus has mastery over the wind and the waves. He's already demonstrated that to them. And yet, Peter becomes afraid. Now, the disciples are often us in these accounts with Jesus, and Peter is often the prime example that represents all of the disciples. So, how did we do without Jesus? Not so good. Not so good. Without Jesus, we don't even recognize Him when He shows up. We still doubt after He tells us who He is and extends us mercy. And even after He's revealed His control and His station as the Son of God, we still let fear distract us from Him. But this story isn't about what goes on without Jesus. Nor was any of what we learned in VBS about us really making waves on our own. Rather, this story is about what is, what is possible with Jesus and what He does to us and for us. So, now we're going to go through the story and we're going to look at the stuff that happens with Jesus. So, the first failure was not recognizing Jesus and think He's a ghost. He's, they're all very afraid, and immediately Jesus assures His disciples. And notice that word in there, immediately. He doesn't stand back and think, well, they didn't recognize me, so I'm going to let them stew in their fear for a little while before, and then they'll start calling out my name, and then I'll let them know I'm here. Now, it says He immediately spoke to them, and He speaks to them His word of assurance, Take heart, it is I. Stop being afraid. It's the same for you and me. There are definitely times where Jesus shows up in our life and we don't recognize Him. Maybe we don't realize it until the moment has passed or the interaction with the person is over or maybe that we've really screwed something up. And yet... Jesus doesn't get angry with us. He doesn't abandon us or cast us out. Instead, He immediately speaks His word of assurance. This word of assurance was given to you today, unqualified, unearned. The next stop was Peter's extra proof. If you really are who you say you are, Lord, do this, which is an outrageous thing to say to the God of the universe. And yet, Jesus doesn't even rebuke Peter when he says this. Instead, in mercy, he allows for Peter's request. And before we start pointing fingers at Peter, know that you and I, we make outrageous demands of God. He's given us more than enough to know who he is, and yet we still want more proof. Give me a sign, Lord. I know that you're at work, but just tell me when it's going to happen. Then I will trust in you. Why don't you simply show yourself? Why did you allow for this to happen? Lurking behind all those statements and thoughts is the same doubt that was in Peter's mind. And how does Jesus respond to our doubts? The same as Peter. He responds with mercy. If you blinked, you might have missed it, but this morning your sins were forgiven. They really were. 
And notice that I didn't have to go around and evaluate each of you individually to figure out if you really did this or that or if you're really sorry for this or that. But that if you come in repentance and faith, the mercy of Jesus is yours. No condition of, well, your faith is, today is at a 25 out of 100. This is not going to work. Or your faith is at a 75 out of 100. Good job. You're okay. That's the way we think, but it turns out that's not the way God thinks. He desires to give you mercy, forgiveness, and life. And so, He does, just like He does for Peter. And just like Peter, again, we've received this wonderful gift of mercy, this faith in God, this forgiveness of our sins, even the very body and blood of Jesus. And yet, like Peter, the wind starts roaring and we turn our eyes from Jesus and we begin to doubt. But again here, the word immediately comes into play. It says, immediately Jesus reached out His hand and rescues Peter. And says, why did you doubt? Oh, you of little faith. So even after Jesus responds to us in mercy, we get, we get distracted with our doubts and our fears, and we lose some of our faith. It shrinks in the face of some of those cares of the world. But Jesus, in mercy, does not let us sink. He immediately reaches out His hand and rescues us. He couldn't say, what does a God have to do? I've done everything I can think of. I've identified myself to you. I've even gone along with your outrageous demands. And in the midst of all of the works of mercy I'm doing, still you doubt me. But He doesn't do that. He immediately reaches out His hand and rescues Peter, and He rescues us. So now that we've looked at the story in that way, do you think Peter would qualify as somebody who made waves? Probably not. Not so impressive, Peter, and by extension the disciples and us. Not so impressive. Yet, it's strange that we're still talking about Peter 2,000 years later. Why do you think that is? Because he was so special and intelligent and courageous? Doesn't seem to be the case, not in this story and not in many others. Rather, we're talking about him because he was chosen, because he was rescued, repeatedly forgiven by Jesus, and granted the gift of of the Holy Spirit. And it seems that the question we need to answer for ourselves before we can even think about making waves is this. Are we with Jesus or without Jesus? We are with Jesus, of course. Or rather, more comfortingly, He is with us. Notice that the direction of everything in the story in Matthew 14 is initiated and completed not by the disciples, but by Jesus. They start by being far away from one another. The disciples in the boat with the waves beating against them. Jesus closes the gap. They're terrified, and they respond in fear, and Jesus closes the gap with His words. Peter makes the demand. Jesus closes the gap in mercy. And then the story ends after rescuing Peter once again with Jesus stepping into the boat. The wind ceases and the real confession of faith occurs. No longer fearful, it is a ghost, but truly you are the Son of God. Who made that happen? Jesus made that happen. Jesus alone made that happen. So what this means is that we can actually make waves. Well, to be precise, I guess, it's He who's making the waves through us. But now that He has come to us, just like He did Peter and the other disciples, He can work through us in incredible ways to make waves in the world. We need to be rescued before 
we can make waves. Jesus reaches out and rescues us immediately. Isn't that incredible? This wonderful promise of God. Look throughout the account in Matthew. Jesus is the one who's doing the work. He's the one closing the distance between us and Him. He rescues you even though you didn't recognize Him, even though you asked Him to prove Himself beyond what was necessary, and even when your faith in Him shrinks in the midst of fear, He reached out to rescue you. So because of this, dear friends in Christ, we can have faith in Him. He keeps His Word, His Word given to us this past week in our theme verse from John chapter 7, verse 38, whoever believes in Me, rivers of living water will flow from them. This is who we have our faith in, none other than Jesus. So how do I, how do you make waves in the world? Have faith in Jesus and keep your eyes on Him. Don't take it upon yourself. We saw how that turned out for the disciples, and many of us know how it turns out for us when we do the same. Not good. No waves are made. But keep your eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. Hear His Word. See Him coming to you immediately, comforting you in your fears, reaching out to you to rescue you. And know that He can and will work mightily through you to make waves in the world. In the name of Jesus, amen.